Kansas, qui est écrit à la suite de tests au Canada du Haut Institut de Stinalada, et même que le ministre Brendan Burke, professeur et nos, qui est écrit à l'Institut. Thank you all for coming tonight. It's a very rainy evening. We have a very full house. Uh, that attests to the quality of our speaker and subject. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, um, I would also like to um, announce our upcoming lectures, uh, three of them. Uh, on Wednesday, February 20th, uh, we will have Toph Marshall from the Department of Classical, Near Eastern, and Religious Studies at the University of British Columbia. And he's currently one of the Elizabeth Whitehead visiting professors at the American School. And he will be speaking on a really intriguing titled talk called Freddie Mercury and Other Classical Poets. So that should be great. Um, great. On Wednesday, March 6th, we will have um, Dr. Zizis Bonias and uh, Jacques Perrault, who is known to many of us uh, for his work at Argylos. And their talk uh, will be on ancient Argylos shops, workshops, and houses of the merchants' quarters. Uh, and then on Wednesday, March 27th, um, our Homer and Dorothy Thompson Fellow, Barbara Scarfo, uh, will be speaking. Uh, she is from McMaster University and here for the year. Uh, and her talk is entitled Mothers and Infants on Funerary Commemoration, a Cross-Cultural Study. So please come out and join us um, in the next few weeks. Tonight, uh, we are very happy to hear about SEEP, uh, the Southern Nubia Exploration Project. Uh, we last heard about SEEP from Zarko Tenkosik in 2016 here at the CIG. This project is very special to our institute. Uh, under the leadership of the late Mac Wallace of the University of Toronto and Don Keller, SEEP conducted uh, several years of survey uh, in the uh, uh, southern Nubia. Um, yes, our co as co-director, our speaker tonight, Jerry Wickens, has contributed much to the project's aims uh, to study the human and mat material and environment in this important part of Greece. Uh, Jerry received his BA from Dartmouth College and PhD from Indiana University and recently retired from the Anthropology Department of Lawrence University in Appleton, Wisconsin. So we're very happy to have him now residing here in Athens. Uh, in addition to his work in Eubea, he participated in the excavations of Frankney Cave in the Argolid. Uh, he's conducted fieldwork in Albania and Attica. He's currently a member of the American School of Classical Studies, uh, where he is conducting a diachronic study of the use of Attic caves and rock shelters. The topic of his lecture tonight is the project that he and other members of SEEP of coordinated under the auspices of the Canadian Institute. And I should also mention too, <coughs> there's also a the publication here too, among the other SEEP publications, um, an archaeological <coughs> survey of the boros Kastri Peninsula at the southeastern tip of Eubea. So the results of the survey uh, were published in 2018. So I would like us all to please welcome uh, Jerry Wickens. Yes, thank you all for braving the rain. I hope your feet are not too wet so you're uncomfortable. Um, anyway, it's, it's a pleasure to be able to speak to you tonight about the results of our archaeological survey of the Boros Castries Peninsula in southern Evia. And I thank the Canadian Institute for inviting me. I need to thank them for more uh, than just the invitation, since this project, as Brenda just said, conducted by the Southern Avia Exploration Project, or SEEP, was a joint Canadian enterprise operating, uh, operating under the auspices of the Canadian Institute. It provided in, invaluable assistance uh, in obtaining the necessary permit from the efforts of prehistoric and classical antiquities in Calquis. I am also very grateful to them in that effort. My co-authors you see on the screen are as much or more responsible for the results of the publication than I am. The Boros Castri Peninsula, this peninsula there, uh, is at the is at the southeastern tip of Evia. It forms the eastern bay of the Caristos, uh, the eastern side of the Caristos Bay, with the Paxamadi Peninsula making up the western side of the bay. At the head of the bay is the modern center of Caristos. Uh, uh, the modern center of Caristos, ancient Caristos, was first at Placari at the base of the at the base of the peninsula, and later it moved to, Par to Par Paleohora, just uh, north a bit north of of, uh, of modern of modern Caristos. In antiquity, Caristos was one of the four poles of Evia, 
but in many ways the, the Charistia, which extends north to the Narrows by Styra, stood apart from the rest of Evia as an island in itself, at times closer to the Cyclades or Athens than, than to northern Evia. A, a late 12th century CE treaty between Venice and the Byzantine Emperor <coughs> Alexios III Angelos excuse me, literally speaks about the islands of Karistos and Andros, uh, its immediate neighbor to uh, the east. A second important aspect of the, of the location of the boros castrine Peninsula and Karistos is its immediate connection to and reliance upon the sea. It lies at the junction of two major sea routes, one heading southeast to northwest through the Evian Channel, uh, the, uh, the other southwest to northeast uh, through the important but often treacherous Caffirian uh, Straits. Uh, this straight right there. Uh, which connected Athens with its bread baskets uh, in, in, the, in the north and later <laughs> was an important supply route between uh, Greek, Greek lands and Constantinople. Obviously it is this second route uh, with which our, pen our peninsula is more involved as it forms the Strait's western side with Andros uh, forming the eastern side. The Evian site uh, that, that was most important for this sea route is Kostri, which is the ancient Garaistos, a relatively small port, but, but the only deep sea port <coughs> on the channel. Its importance will become one of the themes of my talk. And there you can uh, see uh, Kostri right there. A third characteristic of the peninsula which affected its use was its rugged topography, as shown on this map. The backbone of the peninsula is formed by the ridge of Mount Kukuvaya, a southeastern extension of Mount Oki, angling south-southeast all the way uh, to the southern tip of the peninsula. The peninsula's ruggedness renders it agriculturally marginal when compared to the more fertile land around the Caristo Center, located to the west of the peninsula. The ruggedness is softened by flatter areas uh, near the coast and by small valleys, especially on the peninsula's eastern side. Before, before the Seep surveys, the Kursti was poorly known archaeologically. Seep was founded in 1984 by the late Malcolm Wallace of the University of Toronto, who wrote his doctoral dissertation on the classical history of Karistos, and by Donald Keller of Indiana University, whose doctoral dissertation was a survey of the Paxamavi Peninsula and parts of the, cent uh, and parts of the central Karistos area. Uh, his, uh, his dissertation survey was the area within the, 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 the dotted lines. Seep's first project was an intensive survey of the Paxamavi Peninsula, pale gray area, uh, which was following up on Keller's dissertation work. The prehistoric finds from that were published by uh, INSTAP in 2013. The second seat project was this survey, uh, here in the dark, dark, dark gray, of Boros Castri, the original field work having been done in 1989, 1990, and 1993. Uh, the uh, work on the project was suspended from 1993 to 2003 when work on the publication started. Two other sur surveys have since been concluded. One, one of the Campos, or, or plain, <coughs> the Campos Plain, which is the black area, that was a Synergasia with the Ephorin in Calchis, and that was led by Maria Hidiriglu, who I'm very pleased is with us tonight, and by Jarko, uh, Jarko Tankasic. Uh, the second, a, a Norwegian project under the direction of Tankasic, uh, of the upland Katsaronia plain, uh, the, the area with angled lines. More work is currently be done, uh, being done by the Dutch at the site of Plakari on Paxamavi uh, and also on Boros Castri. Altogether, we now have a much, a much fuller picture of life in the Caristia through time. The survey of Boros Castri Peninsula, covering some 45 square meters, uh, was extensive, not intensive, like the Paxamavi survey. That is, the total surface of the peninsula was not walked over. But it was not a random survey. Early modern land routes were used as, as, as survey transects in the belief that, that the same routes would have been used in antiquity before the invention of the bulldozer. 
88 sites or find spots were identified in total, as shown on this, as shown on this map. We defined a site as a locus of cultural features and artifacts in situ and potentially interpretable. A fine, a fine spot, on the other hand, is a locus of artifacts of a potential site or of unexplained cultural material. <coughs> Note that the sites and, fi and, and fine spots are scattered across the peninsula, not just on the coast. Most, however, are not higher than about uh, 300 meters above sea level, and that may be par partially due to where the modern land routes are. <coughs> This map categorizes the, the sites of all periods by function. Three main types of, of sites were identified. The first group I label as agricultural pastoral sites, sites used by farmers and pastoralists. Those are the hollow circles. Ten of these can be classified as rural isolated farms serving as primary residences, the full circles. For 20 more, 20 more uh, sites, agricultural pastoral sites, the exact nature of the use is not clear. A number of them might well, well have been farms, but too little information was, was obtained to be certain. Some may have been the location of agriculture or pastoral activity, but not long-term residences as farms were. We should expect a variety of such sites, for example, sites uh, used only during the harvest or as shepherd's Montreal. More research needs to be done to create a typology of such sites and their archaeological correlates. A second category are are, is towers, shown by the derricks. They're not, they're not oil wells. Uh, here, primarily <laughs> watchtowers, as evidenced by the string of, su of such sites above and along the coast, and one at a high point in the center of the peninsula. A third type, settlements or hamlets, the circles with a black dot, uh, are relatively few. The notable one is Garaistos, and right there. Uh, other categories represented by uh, only one or a few examples include kilns, graves, segments of road, chapels or shrines, a fort, and a quarry. Now I'm going to just uh, do a chronological o overview of, this, of the uh, survey, survey results. The first sign of, of human use of the peninsula dates from the end of the Neolithic and the beginning of the Bronze Age. Five sites and seven fine spots date from these periods. As you can see, they are found both in the uplands and near the coast. The, up, the, up, the upland sites, such as this final Neolithic site, uh, uh, located on a large outcropping on a ridge top, commands a 360 degree view. Here we are looking from, uh, from the site uh, to the east over the Kefirian Straits. Andros is lost in the mist. So it, it might be that even this early the inhabitants were concerned with watching the sea routes, uh, perhaps as a defensive measure against foe or to, modern, or to monitor the movement of friend. Of course, they could also see a few, few movements on land. Uh, there are some scrappy wall fragments on the site, and it would, it would also serve as a suitable pastoral station. The other two upland sites uh, might, might serve a similar function, having a, view, having a view over the Bay of Karistos. A slightly greater number of sites and, fi and fine spots, especially early Bronze Age examples, are located near the coast. Here we are looking down the coast to an early Bronze Age site on the, fir on the first peninsula, uh, and on the first peninsula, and an early an early Bronze Age fi fine spot on the small second peninsula. The spot where the photo was taken from is itself the location of a final Neolithic fine spot, and incidentally, a classical a classical tower. So although the sample size is not large, it seems, it seems that the early Bronze Age inhabitants preferred coastal locations. Coastal promontories are also the locations of early Bronze Age sites elsewhere, so this is not surprising. Certainly by, the time, uh, certainly by this time, sailing was relatively common, so the need for easy access to the waterways, as well as the ability to monitor them, would be a concern. 
Here we are looking over our most prolific early Bronze Age site, located on a hill but close to the <coughs> sea, again over, over the Caffirian Straits to Andros. Few of these sites have any identifiable surface features. The partial remains of a cyst grave were noted at the early Bron Bronze Age Peninsula site, and as I, as, I, as I have mentioned, wall fragments are evident in the upland final Neolithic site. Most of the evidence comes, comes from sherds and chipped stone found at the sites. The pottery is typical for later Neolithic and earlier Bron uh, uh, Bronze Age periods, plain and courseware, mainly open shapes and decoration limited to plastic bands and impressed decoration. The spindle whorl at the bottom of the, left, of the left slide indicates that pastoralism was practiced as well as farming and no doubt fishing. These clearly show that the Charistia was part of what is known as the Attic Kafala culture, indicating that from this early date the Charistia and Southern Attica had closer tile uh, ties to the, uh, to the North Cycladic Islands, such as Andros and Kea, than, than with the rest of Evia. Here are some of the chipped stone. The right, the right hand page are mainly FN pieces. Of, of, for example, in the upper right, the tanged arrowhead, uh, which, which was common in both the final and late Neolithic. The left page shows the predominant use of blades in the, in the early Bronze Age. There was evidence uh, of both on-site working of the stone and pieces brought in from elsewhere, and production both by specialists and less proficient local users. I am very grateful to Tracy Cullen and Laurie Talavay for, for studying the prehistoric pottery and for the site analysis, and to Catherine Perles for analyzing the chipped stone. Uh, thus, the Burroughs Castree Peninsula shows a relatively light use by herders and probably farmers in these periods, with the greatest uh, focus on the coast, especially the eastern coast, and with an evi evident concern to keep track of the sea routes. <coughs> there is evidence of greater prehistoric, of somewhat greater prehistoric use of the region to the west of the peninsula in the area of modern Karistos, its northern suburbs, and on the Paxamavi Peninsula. I will just mention two sites. And those sites are going to be, there is a cave at Aya Triada, uh, the site of pottery here, and I'll also point out now uh, the, the hilltop of Aya uh, Nicolaus Milon, which I'll mention in a bit. The Aya Triada cave to the north of Karistos was the earliest known site in the region, visited as early as the late, as the late Neolithic, with use extending into the early Bronze Age. It is a closed, damp cave with an, with an active river in its deeper zones, so it, was un, so it is unsuitable for long-term habitation, and there is evidence of ritual use and burials in the areas closer to the mouth. It was excavated by Fanis Mavridis of the Ephoria of Paleoanthropology and Stereology and as Jarko Tankasich of the Norwegian Archaeological <coughs> Institute. This, the second site of Plakari, Uh, here, uh, uh, here uh, is this plaquerie. Here it is being excavated by a Dutch team under the direction of Jean-Paul Grillard of Rije Universiteit Amsterdam. Keller had previously conducted a brief test excavation there. The site has a long history, having first been used in the final Neolithic, then again starting in geometric times when a sanctuary existed on the hill. Settlement continued at, it, uh, at, at the site, and the first polis center of Karistos was located there and at the, at the base of the hill uh, on the other side of the hill there. Uh, through archaic and early classical periods. One of the continuing mysteries of, of the Charistia is the virtual absence of any Bronze Age sites after the early Bronze Age. The only known site is shown, hill, uh, shown here, <coughs> occupied in the middle, hel middle Helladic period and very early late Helladic. As was the case with, with, uh, with the late Neolithic to early Bronze Age sites, it shows close contacts with the Cyclades. No other middle or late Helladic site is known, even though the probable place name, Karmuto, uh, presumably referring to Karistos, is known from a Linear B nodule at Thebes. Contact between Thebes and the Charistia 
is further indicated by the discovery of 10 Cipollina marble fragments from a frieze uh, within the house of Cadmus. Southern Evia is the only probable source for that type of marble. So presumably there was some Mycenaean presence in the area, but a very light one. It is common for the Cycladic islands not to have a wide scatter of Mycenaean material. On Caia, the only Mycenaean site is found at Ierini, but there is Ierini there. If Karistos has a parallel settlement, uh, it is as yet unknown. The lack of any Mycenaean material is perhaps especially perplexing owing to the, the, peninsula, uh, the peninsula's location on major sea routes that were almost certainly used throughout the later Bronze Age. Karistos and Styra are mentioned in Homer, and, the, and in, the Odyssey, in the Odyssey, and in the Odyssey, Karistos, located at Castoria, you may have told me this slide, <coughs> bear with me, uh, is, mention, is mentioned as an important harbor where sailors offered sacrifices to Poseidon before and after navigating the dangerous Caffirian Straits, including the returners from the Trojan War. But mention in Homer is more a relic of the port's position in the 8th century rather than the Mycenaean period. And from what we know about the Christia in the geometric and archaic periods, the polis seems to have been relatively prosperous and active. The geometric sanctuary of Placari, established perhaps as early as the 11th or 10th century BCE, seems to have been a regional shrine along the lines of Zagora on Andros. But except for the assumed uh, activity at Garaistos, uh, the Boros Castri, uh, Boros Castri Peninsula remained silent until about 500 BCE. The only clear archaic site on the peninsula is the sanctuary site of Eleni Co in the Potamos Valley at the northern end of the survey area. There, a chapel, the modern chapel of Ios Constantino, seen here, uh, contains many ancient blocks of Parian marble. And there is a fragment of a pedimental lion from the site in the Calchis Museum, dated to around 500 BC. Also illustrated here is the monumental sandstone terrace wall at Eleni Co on which there were some of uh, 40 dedicatory inscriptions, which need not be that this, this early. But clearly it was an important shrine. There may have also been a building with uh, columns at Garistos by 500 BCE. It is only around 500 uh, that we see relatively intense activity on the peninsula, as clearly indicated on this map. 47 locations dated to classical to early Hellenistic times have been identified, of which 34 are sites, the rest fine spots. <coughs> At least 15 of the sites were unquestionably inhabited by the second quarter of the 5th century. As you can see, they are found both along the coast and in the, up and in the uplands, especially on the western side of the pen peninsula. Most of them are small sites, most less than half a hectare, and many less than a tenth of a hectare. As to function, 16 of the 34 sites can be termed, can be termed agricultural <coughs> pastoral, with about six being clear or probable farms, uh, such, a, uh, uh, such as this one uh, in the center. The farm itself is right in this little knoll there. Uh, such as this one. It is a simple, as you can plan it on the, the side, that the farm building <coughs> is here, the threshing floor is modern. It is a simple square, three-room building located on a knoll next to a patch of arable land and close to a spring. Such locations are common in this mostly rugged peninsula. The settlers, not surprisingly, preferred the more favorable eco-niches. It is also quite likely that the slopes were terraced. <coughs> Uh, the, build, the buildings were built with dry stone walls out of the local schist limestone. The wall construction may, may well have looked like the early modern building pictured on the right. Roof tiles were found infrequently, and it is quite possible that many of the houses had flat roofs in the Cycladic tradition, again like the house on the right. The pottery found at these rural sites or farms tended to be mainly plain or courseware, especially hithras, lopadas, uh, lids, lacanis, bowls, and parchers, 
made of local plain or coarse red fabric. Although there are, there are also pieces of important fabrics, including black gloss, a few certainly attic. Pithoi, including some decorated with stamped bands and some Greek transport amphora fragments, were also recovered. <coughs> Beehives are relatively common. The examples on the right come from some ten classical sites. Few other artifacts are found. <coughs> they include loom weights, spindle whirls, and the, and the occasional hand grinder or small quern. Oil and wine presses may not have been permanent fixtures, as they are in Roman times. In one case, we, or I should say Susan Rotroff, working from the pottery, were able to show a clear connection between three sites situated relatively close to one another in the northwestern part of the survey area. A villa, a village, or hamlet at about 300 meters above sea level, a farm a short distance downslope, and a kiln on the promontory on the, on the coast below them. The village, so identified uh, from a relatively heavy continuous sherd scatter over approximately two hectares and some wall fragments, uh, was established er early in the 5th century and continued in use until sometime in the 3rd century BCE. The farm site, the same one I've uh, spoken about uh, previously, uh, was established a bit later in the 5th century, continuing like the village into the 3rd century, into the 3rd century. Uh, the uh, kiln was used, was used from circa 330 to 250 BCE. Its location on the coast both would re remove the smoke and fumes from the habitation sites and make it easier to transport the products by boat. Yet some of the pottery uh, fired here probably stayed close by. The pottery it produced was identical to the heatra, parchers, lids, and other shapes used in the village. Furthermore, the frequency of pot supports often used in pottery manufacture that were found on the farm suggests that some of the, some of the pots found um, at the kiln were thrown at the farm. <coughs> Uh, between the village and the farm ran a stretch of old roadway that most likely connected the Polis Center at Karistos to the port of Garistos at Castri. Its course can be followed for much of the way, and this slide uh, shows a paved stretch on the eastern side of the peninsula above Castri. Uh, it's roughly, whoops, it's <coughs> where that squiggle is. That's, that's Don Keller, by the way. Uh, it is not closely dated, but it is certainly pre-Turkish. Seven classical towers have been identified. As I noted earlier, <coughs> uh, they, they are almost certainly watchtowers and communication relay towers, uh, mainly located on ridge tops with good views over the Bay of Karistos and the Kefirian Straits. A need clearly existed to watch the Kefirian Straits uh, for ships and changes in the weather and to relay information to Garistos uh, or to the center at Karistos, by that time perhaps already at Paleocora, a few kilometers north, uh, north of modern Karistos. This brings us back to several interconnected issues. One, the crucial location of the peninsula on an important north-south sea route. Two, Garistos itself, and three, the relationship of the port and the polis of Karistos to its neighbor Athens. It might be helpful now to review briefly the history of Karistos in the 5th century. Karistos was relatively prosperous in the uh, geometric and uh, archaic periods when the Buros Castri Peninsula was mainly uninhabited. It ran into difficulties, however, in the first half of the 5th century. When the Persians invaded in 490, Karistos resisted its demands for hostages and support. As a consequence, the Persians besieged the town, then at Plakari, and ravaged the countryside. There are reasons to believe that they did not, however, destroy the town of Karistos. When the Persians returned in 480, the Karistians immediately meet us. This, this would have posed a, per a particular threat to Athens, since Andros, Andros had al also gone over to the Persians leaving the Kefirian Straits open to them. Fortunately, the part of the fleet the Persians sent to Athens uh, via that route was destroyed by a storm uh, in the 
Evian hollows off the northeastern tip of Evia by Cape Porphyrius. Um, there's Cape Porphyrius in the hollow. As punishment for their medizing, the Athenians not only imposed a stiff penalty on Karistos, but also ravaged, ravaged its land on their way back from a failed <coughs> attempt to take Andros. Then sometime between 475 and 469, the Athenians went to war with Karistos, probably because it had resisted, resisted their demand to support them in their continued fight with Persia. Karistos surrendered, and it was forced to join the Delian, Delian League contribute troops and ships, and pay a heavy tribute as a League member. Malcolm Wallace also believed that other consequences may have been that it was denied an independent navy and forced to cede land at Garistos, or at least lose some of its control over the harbor. Noting the crucial location of Garistos on the important sea route to the northeast, Wallace suggested that the port may have been at the heart of the struggle of this struggle in the 470s. A distinguished Athenian general named uh, Hermolikos died in the battle, perhaps near Boros, and was buried at Castri, highlighting the importance of that place to Athens. It's clear from Thucydides that he wasn't killed at, at Garisto, so they had to move the body. Uh, 20, 20 years later, about 450, Athens sent a clerici of 250 or 500 people to Evia, half of whom were sent to Caristos. Aristos' tri tribute to Athens was reduced twice at, around this time, the first time to compensate for them for the clerici, the second time compensating them either as, for an exemption uh, from port taxes at Garistos or because Athens had taken over those revenues from Caristos altogether. Clearly, Garistos was as important to the Athenians as to the Caristians, perhaps even more so, and thus probably uh, the primary reason for the towers watching over Garistos and the Caphirian Straits. The damage that Karistos suffered at the hands of the Persians and Athenians would certainly have, have had immediately ne immediate negative effects on the, its prosperity. <coughs> These effects seem to have been relatively short term, however, for there is evidence that Karistos continued to be moderately uh, prosperous in the 5th century and an active, fully functioning polis. In the first, in its first series of uh, series of coinage begun in the sixth century continued until about 465, well after the Persian seas. Uh, it dedicated a bronze bull to Delphi in 480. Perhaps most telling was the considerable tribute assessed by the Athenians in 470 when Caristos joined uh, joined the league. That itself presupposes a, a degree of continued prosperity. The 12 talents demanded was too much for an impoverished polis to pay. Uh, it, it, it would not have been assessed if Athens had not believed that Caristos could pay it, even if the high assessment was meant to be a punishment. There are wealthy 5th century graves near the modern, uh, near modern Caristos, which there's no reason to think did not belong to Caristians, and evidence for a well-appointed sanctuary at Paleohora, uh, perhaps by the late 5th century. All in all, it seems plausible that the Christian finances remained sound in the 5th century. Its prosperity continued uh, through the 4th century, except for the years uh, 411 to 395, when Evia was under Spartan control. Caristos remained close to Athens and followed its policies more so than did other Evian polis. Yet in the 4th century, it was more an independent trading <coughs> partner than ongoing ally. In fact, the increased occupation on the boros castri Peninsula from early in the 5th century uh, may itself reflect the prosperity. Although most of the inland sites were small-scale agricultural pastoral sites, collectively they support the view that the Caristia was moderately prosperous and well populated throughout the 5th and 4th centuries. Even though some of the sites may have been occupied for only a short period, it is clear that sites existed in the countryside throughout this period, uh, and occupation at some individual sites, for example the village, spanned the whole period until sometime in the third century. Though mainly of sub a subsistence economy based on farming, herding, beekeeping, and related industries and activities, surplus pr uh, products from the sites, such as honey, 
may have played a role in helping, uh, in helping the overall economy. One question the survey failed to answer is the location of the Athenian clerici. Some farms on the Paximali Peninsula that Keller had identified as a possible location at um, Paleopithari uh, do not seem likely, although perhaps they may have been farms belonging to Christians displaced by the uh, clerici. Given the Athenian interest in Geraistos, perhaps it was located in that vicinity, in vicinity or in one of the adjacent valleys. Wallace <coughs> suggested that the clerici may have been in the Potamos Valley to the north of Geraistos. where the Hellenic House Sanctuary was. Seep surveying in that valley was limited. Uh, the more fertile areas east of Heliochora, which was certainly the Polis Center in the 4th century, might, might have been its location. That area also remains to be well surveyed. Thus, in the 5th and 4th centuries, the peninsula shows for the first time a relatively large number of small sites spread across the peninsula, both along the coast and on the mountain slopes. Even though, the land, even though the land there was marginal in agricultural terms, there was an evident need and desire to occupy the land in a more extensive and intensive way than in the, in the archaic period. This points either to an increase in population or a more dis dispersed settlement pattern, or both. Such an increase in small rural sites is seen in other Greek surveys, so it, so it is a pan-Hellenic phenomenon, perhaps at least, at least partially spurred by the spread of democracy which favored small landowners. Yet some of the reasons may have been local. Early in the fifth century, uh, some of the dispersal may have been the result of the attacks by the Persians and Athenians. Later in the century, the arrival of clerics may have created a need for more farms uh, for those displaced, uh, displaced by it, if, if not for the clerics themselves. If some of the Athenian livestock sent to Evia at the beginning of the Peloponnesian War came to the Caristia, uh, that for a short while might have led to a greater need for pasturage. Finally, fulfilling the Athenian tribute, or increased supply of goods to Athens during the Decalean War, may have, may have spurred an increase in farming and herding. As this slide illustrates, by the Middle uh, Hellenistic period, circa 250 BCE, there was a very dramatic decrease in the number of sites, especially in the, in the areas away from the coast. In fact, only four shirts can be definitively dated to the second half of the third through the early first century BCE. The only evidence of inland activity was some slight evidence of continued use of the village a village site and adjacent farm in the northwestern part of, of the peninsula. That's the sites uh, 12 and 14 there. Uh, even along the coast, there are only three sites and two fine spots. Garistos continu continued in use, as did possibly a nearby tower, and a shipwreck of the 3rd century BCE is reported from Castry Bay. Little is known about site 32, this small site at the bay, at the bay of Boros, uh, but further exploration might reveal it to be another settlement. It is one of the few sites with evidence of late archaic use and a fragment of a Hellenistic mold-made mold bowl imported from Athens was found there, so someone was eating well. The function of site 3 in the, north, in the northwest remains unclear. It is just a heavy, mainly classical sherd scatter. The situation does not change in the early or middle Roman times, although the shirt count picks up a bit in the, in the, in the latter period. Uh, uh, in both periods, the only certain site other than Geraistos is a Cipollino quarry at the very southern tip of the peninsula just above the coast. No doubt the stone was removed from the quarry by boats. Uh, it would date to the 2nd to 3rd century in the Common Era, rather <coughs> late for Cipollino quarrying, which declined sharply uh, starting uh, in the early 2nd century. The peninsula does not seem to have been affected by any prosperity both, uh, brought by this, uh, this, this quarry or those uh, nearer to Caristos, and there are no nearby sites that might have served the, quarry, the quarrying uh, here or the quarrymen. 
Thus, we are left with an approximately 500-year absence for evidence uh, for use of the peninsula in the Middle Hel Hellenistic through Middle Roman period. Yet, evid yet evidence from the Polis Center, still at Paleochora, suggests that it continued to remain prosperous, and Geraistos was still active. So it seems clear that in Middle Hellenistic times, uh, that, that we are at least looking at nucleation of settlement, with people moving to Paleochora or its, envi or its environs um, um, and to, to Geraistos. A disposition not to live in isolated sites certainly took hold. The decrease in sites in these, per in these periods is again seen in other surveys of Greece, and it has generally been attributed to the wars and general instability of the times and the rise of piracy. <coughs> Certainly piracy may have made people avoid isolated sites. Uh, Susan Alcock has suggested that another factor uh, um, is, is that with the demise of democracy, the states disregarded the small landowners and raised taxes, which led the farmers into debt and consequent loss of their land, and land, land which uh, could, could be at some point acquired uh, by wealthier landowners to create larger estates. That might well have been the case, although there are no signs of larger estates in the peninsula this early. Most scholars um, also believe that depopulation may have accompanied uh, uh, the mid-Hellenistic the mid nucleation. We seem to have uh, nucleation here, but it is not clear that there was depopulation. We cannot answer that question until we have more evidence about the population and the size and prosperity of settlement at Paleochora and the more fertile areas around it. If the rural, more marginal, uh, more inland uh, slopes of the peninsula were exploited during these periods, it, uh, it was most likely as, pas as pasturage. But even if it were used in that way, it was done with an unusually light footprint. In the late 3rd or 4th century of the Common Era, uh, we, uh, we again see a significant but moderate number of sites um, after, after the 500-year gap, with peak use in the 5th through 7th uh, centuries. 14 sites and 10 fine spots were identified, and sites are now, used, are, are now again common on the interior regions uh, away from the coast. In fact, most of the sites are now set somewhat back from the coast. Nearly all the sites remain agricultural, pastoral, um, as this one illustrates. One of, the few, one of the few farms on the peninsula used in both classical and late Roman times. Perhaps part of the reason for its use in both periods is, is that it is in, in, in an especially good micro niche, even if it is isolated. It is a relatively large site, of about one and a half hectares, uh, as is uh, about one and a half hectares. As is seen elsewhere in Greece, a number of the late Roman sites on the peninsula seem to be larger than the classical farm sites. Even though larger, uh, none, none of the sites on the peninsula seem to be luxurious. Only one hypocaust tile fragment from a site indicates the presence of a bath. None could be called villas or estates. Thus, even if the sites might, might have had wealthy owners, they may have been inhabited and run by tenants. More well-appointed sites, uh, one with a mosaic, are found in and around Paleochora or the Campos, the plain to the west of Karistos Center. A number of smaller establishments are still found on Boros Castri, so some of the inhabitants might be, might be owners and not wealthy. Unlike in classical times, we now find clear evidence of cuttings or press weights to process olives or grapes. At, the, at, at uh, the farm, this press weight was found. There was also a shallow stone <coughs> olive crushing bed. The farm was a small one, so although permanent, uh, it was not probably not for mass production. More so than in classical times, late Roman sites were situated in the Lavavian Cotomos valleys in the northeastern part of the survey area. Uh, these valleys have relatively large extents of gentle and more fertile land than is found on the western slopes of the peninsula, the more favored location for classical sites. Such large sites with uh, sizable stretches of arable land are consistent with Alcock's suggestion that much of the produce uh, from the sites were from market. 
More roof tiles are found at these late Roman sites, both here and on the Paxamount, Mali, and Campus sites. A bit with suggested that the existence of late Roman roof tiles uh, may be evidence of cultivation for the market, the tiles being used to roof storage buildings housing the goods to be marketed. Those valleys are also relatively close to the port of Garaistos, which was still in use, um, and that may have been a factor in choosing the valleys. At Garaistos, a late Roman fort now existed on um, this peninsula here, uh, which, which, forms the, uh, which forms the northern side of the bay. This fort may have replaced the watchtowers and might indicate that there was a greater need to protect the merchandise and ships in the harbor rather than just monitoring site, uh, ship movement through the straits. This taken together with the uh, eastern location of the larger estates might point to the use of Garistos to send supplies to Constantinople. What kinds of produce would have been sent to the capital from here is less clear. Uh, the nature of the alluvial soil would suggest grain or wine, although olives could, uh, would do well on the lighter, well-drained uh, uh, soil of the Oakland terraces or slopes. Honey or wax would also be uh, possible exports. So in late Roman times, as we see, uh, we see an increase in the use of the Eastern Peninsula, but not as intensive a use as was the case in classical times. Although perhaps as much land was cultivated, but from fewer sites. The peninsula still seems to, to be a bit marginal to the central parts of the polis, still in Paleochora and in the Campos to the west, to the west of it. Most of the population seem to live there. The peninsula, falls, the peninsula falls silent again until the 11th century. Only 14 Byzantine loci, of which nine are sites, were identified in the survey, dating from middle and early, and early late Byzantine times. Now nearly all the sites are away from the coast, and instead of farms, of which there were only one or two, we see small villages. Several chapels were also found. Uh, were also found. Keller suggested that piracy may <coughs> still have been a concern. Castri uh, continued to be used as a port, but there was no longer a settlement there. The principal port of the 12th to 13th century would have been located in the main bay of Caristos, where the Bortsi, a coastal fortress, was built in the 14th century. Activity uh, mostly disappears from the rural er areas of the peninsula in the, late, in the later Byzantine period and the whole of the Turcocratia that is from the, 12th, from the 14th through the early 19th century. This may well be owing to the more marginal fertility of much of the, of much of the peninsula compared to, say, Boeotia, which sees an increase in activity in the 16th century. The apparent lack of rural activity, however, may be partially due to our poor knowledge of the local pottery. Piracy may have led people to prefer to live in villages or farms near villages. <coughs> This was the case with two sites, um, one illustrated here, an early, early, modern, far, early modern farmstead. Uh, they are well inland and just a short distance downslope from the modern set settlement of Patanistos, uh, which had been uh, founded by this time. It might be noted that these uh, such early modern farms uh, are, now be, are now still being used, but by shepherds, not as, not as farms. The title of our monograph is Settlement and Land Used on the Periphery. That may, that may be a bit misleading, as it might make people think of the complex core periphery model. Here we use uh, periphery in a more literal, less theory-driven sense. Marginal, simply marginal, or on the edge. In a, in a number of ways, the Boros Castri Peninsula is that. Its land is marginal agriculturally and rugged, and rugged in comparison to the more fertile land around the center of Karistos, especially the upland and inland parts of the peninsula. And it lies at the western edge of the polis, relatively far from the center. Nevertheless, we have demonstrated that it was farmed and used as pasturage when socioeconomic and political situations called for or favored it. The inhabitants knew the peninsula well and developed strategies for taking advantage of its resources. 
One resource, the port of Geraistos, was also far from the Polis center, but it was not marginal at all. It lay at the heart of the relationship between Karistos and Athens, and was, of course, a center for the peninsula itself, important in how the peninsula was used, and the very impetus for some of the sites found on the peninsula. For much of antiquity, the port also connected the regional sea routes and local land routes by which um, most raw materials, products, and persons came into or left the island of Karistos. Thus, we hope that the publication of this legacy material has demonstrated the importance of the peninsula itself and illustrated the relationships and interconnections of this periphery to other centers and um, near and far. Thank you. I'm really not comfortable. I'm not, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm, uh, I cannot answer that question relatively. I just, I just don't know enough about the late slave Roman Thomas. So, I have a question. That yes. I'm asking the nicest possible way. The photos you show are very beautiful, mm -hmm. and it doesn't look very built up at all. Are they recent, or were they taken? I drank them. Survey? Yeah, well, but it looks so beautiful. I know it is so beautiful, but it is being very built up. And uh, I do have, if you, well, if you look in the book, there's uh, there's a number there. What, what's happening on the what's happening on the peninsula, especially on the uh, on the western side, is that uh, uh, a lot of uh, retirement uh, uh, groups are buying up buying up lands uh, both on the Paxamali Peninsula. And on um, and Boros Castri with the hopes of selling them to Athenians for their summer houses. And uh, not too many houses have been built yet, but a lot of roads have been built. And so if you look at it from the aerial view, you'll see a lot of roads. Uh, I should have shown them, but I was just trying to stay with the pretty pictures. But it is definitely, and that was one of the reasons why we decided uh, to uh, uh, have an extensive you know, survey rather than intensive, we, we really wanted to uh, uh, get catalogs, all the sites that, that, that we knew about, so that the FRA could come in and say, no, you can't build there. Yes, uh, of course, for the classical archaeologists, the marble uh, right. is the, the most uh, yeah. well-known example. Can you estimate how much that contributed to the economy of this region was that? Uh, well, as, you, as you said, the origin yeah. from Macedonian times, you have traces. Yeah, I don't, well, well, it doesn't, I mean, I was concentrating on this peninsula, <laughs> and as I said, it doesn't seem to have made much. But certainly in the, uh, you know, it, it, it comes in the, you know, the, really the first and second century, uh, uh, you know, CE. And it must have had a, uh, it must have had an impact. Maria, do you want to comment on that? It's, it's, there are so many open questions on uh, the whole of uh, Southern Nubia. So it's a good thing that we have a start <laughs> with it, all that. It's also unclear to what extent, I mean, it, 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 as I understand it, it was basically uh, you know, run by the, the state. And so uh, they may have made more money. It's unclear whether or not how much they would have plowed back into you know, in, in, into the region. Uh, and presumably the stories were run by slaves. And so, uh, but again, I can't answer that specifically. Uh, but you're right, it's, it's what, it's what Karistos is, is certainly known for. Yes? Um, has there been any progress in pinning down the, the sanctuary of Poseidon at Ugeras? Well, not, not, not specifically. I mean, uh, you know, we certainly we know that that's where it was. Uh, uh, a site, uh, I mean, a stoa site was excavated, uh, you know, back, way back, you know, recently, in, you know, which comes of a fairly good, uh, what I think it's a fourth century building with uh, early 
uh, you know, with some earlier material in it, but that doesn't seem to be the doesn't seem to be the sanctuary. Uh, you know, Don Keller and I would like to put it on that northern peninsula, but it, you know, the uh, uh, but uh, we can't seem to, you know, we'd like to put it on that peninsula, but we don't really know. Uh, the the uh, the, uh, uh, the the part of the stele that Jacobson found, uh, which identified which uh, identified which was supposed to be uh, set up in the Poseidon Sanctuary. That, I, I believe, was found uh, closer to the center of there. So um, it's, I guess we're going to have to say it somewhere there, but I don't, I don't know. Near the chapel. <laughs> what? Near the chapel. Near the chapel. Yeah, uh, so right where you, you, you showed. Yeah, yeah. So it would be right around there, yeah. probably. That's the most likely place, because we, we didn't find anything but Roman. I mean, there's some earlier pottery on that northern peninsula, but there's, uh, but there, there's no architecture. Oh, no. Still a lot of questions to ask. The Dutch are going to answer all our questions. <laughs> One of them is here with us today. Yes. Yeah. Pretty, pretty well, then, uh, okay. as one of the Dutch uh, project members, then I would like to say that uh, we did find, because we also went to that northern right. peninsula, and we, t uh, we did find some, some classical material yeah. there. Yeah. Also some Indian chairs, uh, my point is, so we don't have anything conclusive. Yes. Yeah. There's also we now know that there's some um, there's some prehistoric on that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other questions? Well, I would like to say just uh, thank you so much. This was such a well constructed talk. It's very, it's great. It's a great model to uh, to everyone who's worked on uh, legacy material, as you say. Thank you all, and uh, we will uh, have some refreshments afterwards, so please join us. <laughs>